Welcome back to Oak Haven. Today I want to talk to you about a plant that is a forager's dream and a land manager's nightmare. That's this, which is autumn olive. Autumn olive was introduced into the United States in the mid-1800s as a landscaping plant. The government pushed it as a, a plant for erosion control. Uh, it has taken off since then as, and has become a very aggressive non-native weed uh, that's a, a problem in natural areas. We'll get to that a little, little bit. Right now I want to focus a little bit on the foraging aspect of it. Um, as you can see, it in the fall it produces a huge number of these berries. These berries are actually pretty good to eat. And you can find a lot of them and forage a lot of them pretty quickly without too much effort. Uh, the problem with foraging them is that they've got a big seed in them. So most of this fruit is seed. Uh, the seeds are edible. You can eat them. It adds a little bit of fiber to your diet. Um, I would encourage you, if you are foraging these, walking along the woods and, and foraging them, to go ahead and eat the seeds. I would rather have you eat the seeds than uh, eat off the fruit and then spit out the seeds, uh, which would then plant this autumn olive all over the place, which I would rather not have you do because it is such an invasive species. Um, autumn olive is not related to, to olives at all. It's not in the same family. It's not even in the same order. So it's, it's not even closely related to, to olives. Um, but let me talk about how you recognize it. You've got the fruit. The fruit are these red berries and they have these kind of silvery scales covering them. Pretty unique looking. Don't look like much else. The leaves are dark green above, kind of a wavy margin. But the really diagnostic thing is on the bottom, they have this silvery color. They're covered with these silver scales that make it look very unique. It really doesn't look like anything else that you can, you can find. I say that we have autumn olive. There's another species in the same genera, uh, Russian olive, that's found more out west, more up north. That looks very similar to this. The leaves are not oval so much as this. They're more elongated. The, um, the leaves have scales on the top, not just on the bottom. Uh, and the, the fruit looks a little bit different. But really, everything that I say about autumn olive goes for Russian olive, both in its, its foraging aspects and in its uh, obnoxious uh, habit for land managers. The fruit are prized for, for, by foragers both because they taste good and because they're full of vitamins and um, lycopene. Lycopene is what gives it its red color. You often hear lycopene discussed in relationship to, with tomatoes because uh, lycopene is also the, the chemical that gives tomatoes its red color. Uh, there's a lot of lycopene in tomatoes. Tom uh, lycopene is a strong antioxidant. It's a, it's a very healthy thing to be eating. The lycopene in autumn olive is reported to be 17 times higher than tomatoes. It's a little easier to get lycopene from a tomato than it is foraging all of these berries, but it is a good source of lycopene if that's what you're, you're looking for. So that's the foraging. Why is it such a problem for land managers? Well, part of the reason it's a problem for land managers is because it's so prolific in its, its fruit production and the birds will spread the, the seeds around. The other thing is that autumn olive has root nodules where it will fix nitrogen. So recognize that our atmosphere is 80% nitrogen. But plants can't use nitrogen um, in its gaseous form like that. It needs to be converted into another form that it can take up in and, and use as fertilizer. So the bacteria that are in these root nodules um, in the roots uh, produce, or convert atmospheric nitrogen into ammonia which can then be uh, uh, metabolized by the plant and used for, for growth. You hear that a lot for, for legumes, um, but this is something that's not in the legume family, but it does a similar type thing. Uh, different, uh, different species in the root nodules, but a similar concept. What it means is that, that autumn olive can grow on pretty poor soils because it can get its uh, nitrogen from the air. It doesn't have to get it from the soil. And it actually adds nitrogen to the soil. Now, I've read a lot of things where they talk about how that's a positive thing and we should be encouraging autumn olive and should be planting autumn olive because it will it will help the soil by adding nitrogen to the soil. Not really the case. It does add nitrogen to the soil but that's not necessarily a positive thing. 
it's certainly not a positive thing as far as uh, native plant communities. As a tree produces nitrogen and it gets nitrogen out into the soil, it's, it's basically like adding fertilizer to a natural area. That will tend to push towards non-native plants rather than the plants that are, are designed that, that function well here, the, the native plant community. It's particularly important in like a riparian um, setting. If this is growing alongside of a stream and you have nitrogen being produced by the roots here and then leaching out into the, the streams, you get a, um, excess nitrogen in the streams. It produces an algal bloom. The algae dies. It, it knocks out the oxygen. That's called eutrophication. It's a serious problem in our waterways. That's why there's such um, concern about people who put nitrogen on their lawns and then the, the nitrogen runs off into streams and it basically kills off the biota in the stream. We don't want to add nitrogen to our streams. We really don't want to add nitrogen just randomly to our, our woodlands either. The other problem with autumn olive is this. If you look behind me, if you plant autumn olive, this is what you eventually get. You end up with a forest of autumn olive. These are pretty small here, but this will grow up and this will be just a solid monoculture of autumn olive. That's not what a woodland should look like. Let me show you an area where we've cut the autumn olive in years past and you can get a better feel for what woodlands should look like. Look how much more open this is. You've got a more diverse um, plant community on the floor. You've got a, a way for the trees that are dropping seeds to regenerate. The small seedlings grow up. In this mass, you're not going to have that. It just it's too much competition. You're not going to have the same diversity that you have over there underneath this mass of a monoculture of autumn olive. How do we handle autumn olive on our property? First of all, I'm all for foraging. I enjoy foraging. I think if people want to forage this, that's great. Pick all the berries, eat all the berries. That means it's less spreading, okay? That's a great thing. My personal thing, pick all the berries, eat all the berries, and then cut the tree down and get it out of here so that it's not going to be here next year. Um, I would rather see a more diverse habitat than this monoculture of autumn olives. So that's our goal is to, I, you know, it goes back to what, what our goals are. And I think anytime you do any management, you need to define what your goals are. If you're looking for biomass, autumn olive creates a lot of biomass in an area. If you're looking for diversity of plant material, differing plant material, something that's more resilient to, to uh, environmental change, you want to have as many different plants as possible, and they can't compete with something like this. So we're going to get rid of all of the autumn olive here. We're going to do that in two ways. All of the big stuff, we're going to cut with a brush cutter. We're going to treat the ends of it with a 20% glyphosate solution. I really like doing that. We've talked about that before. You can see our video about um, brush control or our video on um, our applicator. We put so little herbicide back into the environment when we cut and we treat the, the stems. Because you cut a stem and you put literally a, a drop of, of herbicide on that stem and it kills it off. It is possible to come through on smaller stuff where it's a little tedious to go through and cut each stem and then treat each stem, and you can treat it. We've tried treating it with a 2% glyphosate solution and doing it kind of late summer when most of the, the um, other plants are, have died back, so it's not going to get onto the seed or get onto the leaves of other plants and kill other plants. Remember, glyphosate doesn't have much soil activity, so it's only going to kill something if it's in contact with the, the leaves. So if the leaves aren't up, if it's spring wildflowers and the leaves aren't up, it's not going to impact that. But you, you spray it on the, uh, the leaves and it can kill the leaves. We've had bad experience with um, glyphosate, at least the 2% glyphosate, on the autumn olive. The leaves are pretty hefty. It just doesn't seem to kill it as well. We've been reading, and we haven't tried it, but we've been reading that a mixture of glyphosate and triclopyr is a better solution, and that, that's what will kill it. It's the same thing that we do with, with bittersweet. We're going to be trying that. We'll, we'll do another video uh, just on that glyphosate triclopyr um, option. Again, though, that's for, for foliar application. When you do things foliar, you're likely to get more overspray 
you're going to have it dripping off of the, the leaves. You know, it will do its job. Sometimes it's necessary to do. My personal preference is cut it off and treat the stem. It's very shotgun, or not shotgun, um, rifle approach, where it's just adding um, herbicide to that one little spot. Other than herbicides on the smaller level, you, you can try weeding it. We've had bad luck with weeding it also. If you try to weed it, it often just breaks off. It's got a pretty serious taproot. If it breaks off, it's just going to re-sprout from the roots, and that just makes it more work for us. So uh, our, our goal in any type of management is we want to hit it and get it done as quickly as possible so that we're not treating and treating and treating. If we're applying an herbicide, we want to hit it with an herbicide that's going to knock it out, not something where we need to put some this year and then do it again next year and do it again next year. We want to give it a chance for the, uh, the ecosystem to recover as quickly as possible. So we want to get it, get it out, and then let the ecosystem recover. So we'll give a brief review of our procedure and what we do for treating brush. Uh, again, we treat it with a 20% uh, glyphosate solution. So we take a 41% concentrate, we cut it down in about half. Uh, that's what this is here. We add a colorant to it so we can see where we've worked. We've modified the sprayer. Uh, you can see our video on modifying the sprayer. So it's got a, we've got a hook here to hang it so it's out of the way. We've, I've got a carabiner on the back that will hook into my belt loop. That keeps it so that when I'm working, I can bend over and it, it leaves it. It doesn't swing into my, into my, my way, the way I'm working. We're cutting with a steel brush cutter. The blade that I'm using is an 80 tooth carbide tipped blade. They're, I buy two of them for about $20 on Amazon. They cut like uh, a hot knife through butter. It's amazing how well they cut, particularly for small things. This just like slices it off so, so smoothly. It's really nice um, rather than just the standard steel blade um, that comes on these brush cutters. So it is a gas motor. Uh, we try to use electric when we can, but this is a gas motor. Normally I have ear protection on, but to be honest, we're out in the woods and I forgot the ear protection. So um, just imagine that I have ear protection on. When I'm cutting small branches, I'm bending over a lot to, to treat. I've got this adjusted so that if I'm holding this with my arm straight, it's holding the, the blade up. So I can go through and I can cut, and I hold that with the blade up while I'm treating. So I'm not setting the blade down or knocking the blade into something, because that is a, it's an unprotected, pretty serious cutting blade. When I'm treating an area like this, I will treat with the brush cutter stems down smaller than a straw. You know, it, they're really small. Again, because I would rather not, I would rather treat the stem than treat the foliage, which tends to spread it around more. A lot of the smaller stuff, it's hard to find in all of the grass. So as I was working, I think it's almost easier to cut it off at six inches above and then those stems are extending up above the grass and other things. And then I can actually go along with the brush and just do it at about six inches above and it hits the top of those stems. The, uh, the 
um, the autumn olive stems just naturally. I may not even be able to see them because they're so small, but it will hit them. There's a temptation when you're working in a big area like this to go through and cut it all down and then go through and treat it after the fact. I just find that that doesn't work very well because I miss too much. So for me, it's much easier to cut, treat, cut, treat, cut, treat. Maybe I'll cut two, maybe even three and treat them if they're all right in the same area, but I never get more than that just because I tend to lose it and it doesn't get treated. And when it doesn't get treated, it sprouts up and then I've got more of a problem uh, that I don't want to deal with. Whenever I post these videos about something that one group of people think is positive, that is a, a benefit like this, the autumn olive that foragers like, or burning bush that people like for their landscaping, or bittersweet because people like it for decorating, um, and my perspective is I would like to get rid of it because I would like to have the, na the native plant community um, thrive more because that's my goal. Whenever I think of that balance, I get comments about, you know, oh, you shouldn't be telling me what to do. You know, if I want to have my property overrun with autumn olive, that's, you know, my right. And I understand the, the, the argument there. My concern is that if you were keeping your autumn olive on your property and not letting it spread all over the place, that would be a completely valid argument. When you're impacting the choices of everyone else in the community around you by your choosing to allow autumn olive to grow, to produce berries, to be spread all over everyone else's neighborhood. I feel like you're crossing the boundary of what's your right to do as an individual. You know, we're all, we're all active parts of the community and we need to consider how our individual um, choices impact the community that we're, we're around. I kind of liken it to the, the group that go to the beach and think that it's their right to have their music blaring because they want to have music blaring. That's true, but maybe everybody else on the beach doesn't want to listen to their music blaring. So maybe there's a way that uh, you can have your cake and eat it too, you know. Go ahead and blare your music with the, the headphones. I don't know what the comparable solution is on allowing autumn olive to grow. I'm just not sure that it's a good argument that I should be allowed to grow whatever I want on my property uh, and disregard how that's impacting the rest of the community at large. Well, thanks for joining us to learn about autumn olive. Hopefully you learned something. Um, hopefully you'll go out and maybe you'll, you'll do some foraging and, and reduce the seed population. Uh, if so, thank you. Ho hopefully more so. You'll go through and you'll cut out some autumn olive and we'll get rid of some of it and allow our natural, uh, our native plant community to, to, um, to prosper. So um, if this was a useful video to you, please hit the like button. If you uh, like what you see and other things that we do, um, we always appreciate new subscribers. We would appreciate it if you would share this video. If you have people, if you know of people that uh, uh, are interested in foraging or are interested in land management, share the video with them. Hopefully it'll be useful to them too. Anyway, thanks for coming along.